All right, we're going to get started. So hello, everyone. My name is Joy McFarland. I am the marketing manager for the US and Canada for National Geographic Learning ELT. Um, thank you for joining us today for this webinar, Empowering Adult Learners to Stand Out in the Workforce, with Rob Jenkins and Stacey Johnson, the authors of Stand Out. We'd like to thank you all for joining us. And before we get started, I'd like to take just a quick moment to go over some light housekeeping. First off, at the bottom of your screen, you'll notice that there are a few icons. The first button on the left is the chat function. So be sure to set your message when you use that to all panelists and attendees to ensure that the whole group can read your message. And this is where you'll be participating in any activities that Rob and Stacy ask you to join in on. And on the right, you'll see a Q&A button. Use that to ask the presenters any questions, and we will do our best to answer those as they come in. And we'll have some dedicated Q&A time at the end of the session to go over your questions. Um, you will receive a certificate for this webinar. Please expect that in about 10 business days. And without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce today's speakers. I'm going to introduce them now. Stacy Johnson has taught all levels of adult ESL, including credit, non-credit, and workplace English. She holds a master's in linguistics with a teaching ESL certificate, which is supported by more than 25 years in the English language classroom. Her passions are teacher training and curriculum development, both of which she does on a continuous basis. Rob Jenkins is a popular presenter and author of English as a Second Language Topic. He is a retired faculty member from Santa Ana College School of Continuing Ed, where he taught ESL for 27 years and served as faculty development coordinator for 20 of those. Rob and Stacy received our 2013 Heinley Outstanding Achievement Award from National Geographic Learning for their textbook series Standout, which is coming out in its fourth edition this year. I will turn it over to both of you. Hi, everyone. Excited to sort of see you. Not really. Um, looks like we got about 220 people here. I'm assuming you guys are from all over. So um, super excited to have you. Thanks for joining us for this brief webinar. Um, we're super excited to be presenting um, Empowering Adult Learners to Stand Out in the Workforce. Um, this is the agenda that we're going to cover today. We are going to start by talking about workforce preparation, kind of give you a background on the history of some of this really quick history of some of the standards and, um, and how it led to us teaching, teaching ESL in the workplace, um, I mean ESL in the classroom. We're going to start off after that by talking about some soft skills that um, you're going to find that employers want in the workplace. We're going to jump into how to integrate those soft skills into the classroom. Then we're going to talk about workplace awareness. How do our students find out about the different opportunities for them that are out there? And then we're going to end by talking about digital, digital literacy, which is important in every aspect of life, but also very important in the workplace. All right, thank you, Stacy. Um, so we're going to start out just talking a little bit about what we are talking about when we say workforce preparation. What does it mean? Um, why is it important in education, especially in ESL, adult education? So um, let's just see where we go from there. Um, in the United States, uh, the Department of Education has what's called a WIOA which is the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. And when the revision of this um, act came through, what it really did was it um, changed our focus a lot. Um, years before, we basically thought about our, our, our students as these people that we were trying to teach English the best we can with in adult education with uh, survival skills, and we were helping them to get through to the next level. That was our objective. That's what we were trying to do. Uh, we would think about um, there were different kinds of standards out there, and so we would think about getting them into the workforce, but we weren't really thinking about long-term goals or careers. Today, we're really talking more about careers, and uh, so when we, when we do that, we are talking more about the whole student, their, what their potential is, where they're going. So when we ask our students their goals, we shouldn't be satisfied with just hearing, okay, your goal is to learn English, but what's your, what's your lifetime goals? It's no longer about just getting to the next level and letting somebody else worry about it. It's, hey, how can we help you now to prepare for your future so that you have a, a greater future and you can go um, further? So that's kind of the idea about it. Um, there's lots of standards that have come out. 
Uh, but uh, one of the most important things that's come out um, recently, um, the government has put out, or the Department of Education is integrated education and training. Uh, all the states in the United States are working towards developing this type of program that integrates education and training together. The idea is to do all of this simultaneously. That means adult um, education and literacy, that's basically what we traditionally have done, um, meaning English language acquisition, integrated English language skills, helping people to develop those type of skills. And then um, also what has traditionally been done in in a separate class or in a class combined with workforce training is workforce preparation, which includes things like critical thinking, digital literacy skills, self-management skills, basic academic skills. We are helping the students prepare for college if they need um, uh, degrees for their careers. We're helping them to think through things so they're not dependent on the teacher and that they can achieve a lot of things on their own and they can work through um, different things. That workforce preparation is really important. One of the things that I noticed as, and Stacy and I have noticed as we, as we have thought about these things, especially workforce preparation is that students don't necessarily know what's out there, what's available to them. So when we say workforce preparation, well, what prep, preparing for what? What jobs, what opportunities? There's a lot of opportunities students don't know about. Maybe students don't know about the gig economy, for example, or maybe they, they don't know that there's opportunities in construction or that there might be that those that want to um, do things in, uh, for example, be an architect, that there are certain schools they can go to for that. They may not know about the different opportunities. So we've added one to this from workforce preparation and that's awareness of potential job market. So we want them to know what's out there. And then of course, um, workforce training becomes um, super important. Uh, but all of these things are supposed to be done simultaneously. The ESL classroom, we're suggesting the ESL classroom can be adult education and literacy and workforce preparation. So that those things are taken care of in the ESL classroom, not just work, not just the literacy part, but also the workforce um, preparation. So that's the kind of thing that uh, we'll be talking about today as we go through it. So what are these skills and what can we do? The skills in the workplace, there's been lots of different ideas about that, but today we have um, employability skills framework and uh, you can just read this, but successful careers are built on solid personal and interpersonal skills, defining, measuring, and building these skills, and even naming, uh, building these skills and even naming them. Um, they, uh, for years and years, um, the Department of Education, different organizations have analyzed and tried to figure out exactly what it takes, what employers are looking for. And we've had lots of different types of um, standards that have come out, but the most recent one, the employability skills, um, you might see that there's a lot in common, but um, these are important. So how do we do this in the classroom? We, it, they want workers that have good communication skills, that can think through problems and they can resolve issues and can figure out how to, um, after they don't have to go back to the employer every minute and say, hey, I don't know how to do this or how do I go about doing this. They can figure out a lot of things on their own so they don't have to constantly go back. Of course, we don't tell them that they shouldn't ask questions. Of course they should, but they need to be able to do that. They need to be able to work in a team and work uh, collaboratively and work with other people. Um, they need to be able to add to that and listen to others' ideas and then work together to build that. So these are kind of skills that we need to use in the classroom so they get the experience and prepare them for the workplace. Another one is technology. That's a big one. Um, now, since COVID, we really see that our students have a lot more potential and workforce or the workforce is, or the workplace is actually requiring more and more technology use. So how can we help the students get comfortable in using the technology um, being in a place where they um, understand and can use it to um, better themselves and better the programs and to get jobs and to maintain jobs. So those are important. These other ones are also really important. Personal qualities, systems thinking, 
uh, personal qualities, meaning, you know, are they, do they come on time? Do they have good um, work habits? Um, systems thinking means that they understand the process and how it works and can put things together. Uh, information becomes super important. Are they able to take the information they have and be able to use it? Um, so they, they're doing more than just checking a box, but they're actually working through things um, like with critical thinking, all of this, all of these things relate back to critical thinking and how they can do that. Resource management, how well to use a resource, resources, including sometimes money, but sometimes um, materials and different things to be able to use that. Also applied academic skills. So they learn things that they need and they need to apply those. So they use that type of skills. So I'll turn the time over to Stacy and she can talk to you a little bit about the classroom. Um, so <laughs> some of you might have noticed that I was laughing or smiling while Rob was presenting. I'm having so much fun in the chat. <laughs> I love seeing where all you guys are from. Someone said, good night. I'm from Ukraine because I'm assuming it's nighttime there and it's really late. Um, just so awesome to see what a great community we have of ESL teachers. And same thing we try to do in our classroom is build community with our students. So anyway, super fun to see all that. I wish we had hours to just sit and chat with you guys in the chat room, but we do have some, some stuff to get to, but oh my gosh, people from Brazil and Chicago and Egypt and oh my gosh, I love it. All right, soft skills in the classroom. So um, we've, we've had a little bit of an, an overview on employability skills and what employers are looking for, but now we wanna talk about how do these translate to the classroom? Um, so applying soft skills in the classroom. So if you guys can um, stop chatting and saying where you're from for just a second and imagine you're an employer and um, imagine you're gonna hire someone, what attributes besides their technical skills, which might be required for a certain job, um, what are you looking for? What soft skills are you looking for? So go ahead, type those in the chat instead of where you're from. Um, what sort of things do you think an employer would be looking for in an employee? Someone who's willing to learn, emotional intelligence, punctuality, collaboration, ability to get along with others, communication skills, teamwork, listening skills. Oh my gosh, you guys are awesome. <laughs> there are so many soft skills that are so important besides what they know how to do. Um, hardworking and curious, responsible, uh, collaboration and teamwork, determined. Okay, these are awesome. So we're going to put a couple up on the screen here and by no means is this an exhaustive list but what employers are looking for is they're looking for people who can make decisions and solve problems exercise leadership roles manage their time complete tasks interact with team members collect and organize information interpret and communicate information and apply technology to a task i love it catherine ditto to all the above yes there there's just so many things that employers are looking for that we can actually bring into the classroom. So um, look at my list right here of my eight things. In your opinion, which of these would also make a good student? Yeah, exactly. All of them. Some of you put one, but then most of you are saying all of them. Exactly. So the things that we employers are looking for are the same things that we as teachers want our students to be able to do. So now let's look at some of the examples from Standout and see what soft skills our students will be working on if they did these activities. Okay, so look at this activity. Um, this is a graph, a housing graph, and what the, what the activity is asking is for you to label the different types of housing in the graph. And then you're gonna listen to a description. We're not gonna listen right now, but you're gonna listen to a description and write the number of units for each type. So imagine you have your students doing this activity. What sort of um, soft skills are they doing? Over to the right, we've just labeled them one, two, three, four, five, six. So all you have to do is write one, two, three, four, five, or six in the chat box. You don't have to write, actually type out all the words. Okay, I see six, good. Interpret and communicate information. Good, five, collect and organize information. Good, number one, make decisions. They're not really solving a problem, but yes, making a decision. Number four, interacting with team members. Great, great. So basically almost all of them, right? 
they may have to manage their time. That might be depending on if the teacher has given them some sort of a some sort of a you know time limit to work on this. And if they were in a group and they were given roles, they might have to do number two. But yes, almost all of them. Great. Okay, let's look at the next one. Okay. Um, hopefully you have a screen big enough that you can see this. I know some of you who are on a phone are probably not going to be able to do this, but um, this is a flow chart. And this is a flow chart that would, um, if you were dealing with a situation in this, in this particular instance, it's from a work unit in standout book four, and it's asking the students to read a flow chart and do they agree or disagree with each step. But what I want you guys to do, I'm going to give you a, a little problem, and I want you to kind of look at this flow chart and just take a minute or two, you don't have to type anything, take a minute or two and kind of go through the steps. So Imagine that Renee is a cashier in a fast food restaurant and a customer just came up and told her that she gave him the wrong change. He doesn't have his receipt and he doesn't rem she doesn't remember helping him. What should she do? Okay, I'm not asking you to tell me what she should do. I just want you to take that um, scenario and kind of go through this flow chart. So what is the problem? Can I solve it myself or do I need a coworker to help me? and kind of go through the chart. I'm going to give you like 30 seconds. Okay, so imagine that you were in class and your students were in class and they were doing this activity, they had a problem, one, two, three, four, five, or six. or all of them. Sorry, someone can't see it. I know it's a little small, if you're, especially if you're on a small thing. Okay. Again, number six, good. Interpret and communicate information. Four, one, one, five, six. Okay, great. Awesome. Good job. All right, let's look at the next one. Okay. So in this one, and again, if the screen is small, that's okay. I'm going to explain it to you. You're given a paragraph and in the paragraphs, it's a description of the cold and the flu. So the students are asked to read this and then they're asked to classify in a table below the symptoms of the cold and the flu. Okay. So what do you think? One, two, three, four, five, six. Good. Collect and organize information. That's probably right off the top. That's probably the most you know, apparent one, correct? Everyone's saying five. <laughs> okay, uh, maybe make decisions, number one, right? Decide, does it go under, is it a cold or a flu symptom? Good, now, not every activity that you give students is gonna obviously have every soft skill in it, right? Some of them are gonna focus more on a few soft skills and some of them are gonna have a lot more soft skills. So you'll notice this one has fewer maybe than, than the ones we did before. Awesome. Okay, one more. Rob. Um, okay, so in this activity, this is sort of similar to the one they just did. They're being asked to classify which places sell goods and which places sell services and which ones sell both. And then there's a Venn diagram where they have to do a good service and then which one does both. Okay, so in this activity, they're taking the information and they're having to write it in the chart. Most likely they're working with a team to do this because we do lots of active, we do lots of group work and teamwork when we're teaching in the ESL classroom. So again, one, two, three, four, five, six. What do you think? Great, I see four, five, six, I see one. Good, again, a lot of people aren't saying three for any of these, and that is because I didn't necessarily give you a time limit, but if a teacher is giving them a time limit, then they do have to manage their time. Okay, awesome, you guys are great. Thanks for playing along. Also, Matt, a lot. Say something? Yeah. Also, a lot of these you can do in groups, and then once you do it in groups, then all of a sudden you have exercise leadership. You have working um, to, together to, to uh, make decisions. So those are always important too. And so a lot of times, if you do it with groups, it makes a big difference. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Uh, something else that we do a lot of in Standout, and if you're not familiar with Standout, that's totally fine. This is stuff you can do in your ESL classroom with whatever textbook or whatever materials you're using. Um, but we do team projects, um, project-based learning, and we try to simulate we simulate the workplace actually, because students are working in groups, they're always working as a team and they're always having to help each other out. 
They have a role. Each person in the group has a role, a different position, and they're asked to complete a project together as a team. So, for example, this is an example of one team project, create a community brochure. And the I'm going to read it to you if you can't see it. It says, imagine that a new family has moved into your neighborhood and you want to tell them all about your community. This is a community unit. With your team, create a brochure about your community. So you're going to see that in this project, there is a leader, a writer, a designer, and city representatives, and they each have different roles. Okay, you guys are already ahead of me. Someone just did this project. Awesome. So what do you think? I see three, I see four, manage time, interact appropriately with team members. Okay, I'm seeing stuff that maybe I didn't see in the previous ones, and that's because I didn't tell you that you were working in a group in those, but now it sort of changes the dynamic when you have students working in groups. Two, four leadership roles for sure. We didn't see that much in the previous um, examples that we did. Yep, yep, all of them. I mean, in this, in this, in team projects, you really have an opportunity to do all of them. And remember, these are just six that we happen to choose that you find in a lot of activities. But there's so many more soft skills that students are um, are working with in the ESL classroom. Okay, um, the next slide. Just to show you an example, and you can, you know, take a picture of this slide or, um, uh, oh, sorry. That was there it goes. All right. There it goes. Um, these are all different examples of projects that we do in Standout. Um, if you're familiar, if you know, you know. If you don't know, at the end of each unit, we have a team project, and that project encompasses everything that students have learned in that unit, whether you do it over one week or two weeks or three weeks. At the very end, there's a team project and it encompasses everything they've learned. So these are just some examples of different team projects that you can do with your students. And the great thing about a team project is, as I said before, it sort of simulates the workplace or it simulates the environment where students are working as a group, working as a team to accomplish a task together. Um, so anyway, these are just some other examples that you might use in your classroom and have students work together um, to complete something. All right. Thank you, Stacey. I, I have to say one thing about team projects. I mean, I love them. They are fantastic. The idea, um, I don't use them at every unit because of the time, because it takes two, two days to do them, but they are fantastic. The students participate. They do a presentation from in front of the class at the end with their team. And uh, we, we started using the last few years, we started using um, PowerPoints and lots of different things and helping the students to really get into technology and other things. And so in developing all of those skills, developing those skills within uh, the classroom. It's not like we're teaching separately workforce preparation. We are teaching it within the classroom. It's integrated just like listening, speaking, reading, and writing are integrated. Everything's integrated together. Um, so moving on from there, we want the students to know what possibilities, what um, approaches what uh, jobs might be available, careers might be available to them so that they can make educated decisions about where they're going instead of saying, oh, you know what, my friend over here is a mechanic, I want to be a mechanic. No, what, what are your future goals for your life? If you're willing to go through the effort to go to school, for example, you could be an architect or go to a trade school or whatever. There's a lot of different things you can do. So we want the students to be aware of that. One of the things that the... Um, uh, the United States government has done is identified 16 career clusters. So we look at these clusters and we get an idea of uh, the students, if they can study these clusters, get an idea of what's available to them. And so we offer them opportunities to um, really um, develop or get ideas about uh, and understand these things. Here's an example. Um, and uh, this, these are the clusters, and here's a little bit, maybe we can just ask you to do this activity real quickly. So it, um, we have divided, there's 16 career clusters, and there's um, six categories, uh, major categories that are there. Um, so look at these and see if you can answer the question. So number one, uh, architect, what cluster or what of the 16 categories would an architect fit in? Anybody have some ideas? Go ahead and, and let us know what you're thinking in the chat box. So number one, architect, is it is it C, 
it's industrial and engineering technology. That's right. Good. All right. And uh, but you can see how they have to start thinking about this. Okay, where where do I fit? What is who is who am I? How do I reach this? Okay, nursing. This is an easy one. Human services, health services, or education and training. Yeah, B. Um, uh, some of you said A, uh, but it's it's B. A A also has human services, so that's important. But we're talking health services in this case, and so nursing becomes the health fields. Um, there's a lot of health fields. There's doctors and nurses. There's uh, hospital administrators. There's all sorts of things, dentists and uh, optometrists. There's all sorts of things that can be done. Number three, you guys are ahead of me. Good. <laughs> I see you going. You guys are anxious. That's yeah, a bunch good. Of teachers in here. Just think how excited your students would be. <laughs> all right. So, the farmer. So, what's in farming? Uh, natural resources, finances, manufacturing. Three, I, I wasn't reading fast enough. You guys are ahead of me. So answer three for me. All right, natural resources, good. And then a musician, which I am. So I need to know which one, where do I fit? B, excellent. All right, so let's, um, let's go even beyond that. So if I were helping my students to understand, the idea is that we give them something like this graphic that has a lot of information. We don't expect them to just memorize this information, but we want them to interact with the inner information. So we give them an activity like we just did. Here's another activity. Oh, man, I put the answers down there. That was bad. OK, so um, here's another activity, hospital and tourism, manufacturing, arts, information. So we're going the other direction now. We have the career cluster. What is the job? And so you can pull some of these jobs. I spun it and some of you already looked at it, but go ahead. Um, what are some other jobs that are up in the box above that fit with hospital and tourism? Any thoughts about that? Airplane mechanic? No, nah, probably not. What would fit? Tour director? Okay, I don't see tour, look in the box above. Tour director would absolutely be right. All right, here's some, there's some answers there. I'm going to give you all the answers in just a minute. How about manufacturing? What would fit with manufacturing? Which one of those jobs above? Carp, I, I see a lot of different ones. You guys are coming up with your own, which is fantastic <laughs> because, I mean, that doesn't hurt. Uh, that also is great. Uh, arts and communication, technology, uh, AV and, and communication. What do we got? All right, and then information technology. Here, I'll give you the answers. See, see how you did. Okay, so these are the answers that are in the book. Uh, hotel housekeeper, park ranger, hmm. airplane mechanic, appliance repair person, artist, film editor, cable TV installer. Great, okay, so that's good. So again, the idea is to interact with the information. So the students aren't just filled with a lot of stuff but they get some opportunities to interact. Do they have to memorize all this? No, but they start to get an idea. They're starting to think about their own lives and their futures and this kind of thing's important. So in standout, what we do and what we suggest that you do, whether you're using the book or not, is you kind of help them to know, for example, what jobs are available to them, um, what, how much do, do these jobs pay? Um, how many people are in the workforce? Is it easy to get a job in that field? Are there a lot of positions open? That type of thing. Um, and then move to, uh, that's pretty general. We usually start with something general like the cluster and then we zero in. In this case, there were zeroing, it was uh, finances. And in this case, we're zeroing in on bank tellers. So banking goes to bank teller. And then uh, so we move from there and then eventually we get into reflection, which Stacy is going to talk about just a little bit. So here are some examples. So we, we talked about this already. We introduce them to the clusters. We help them understand that they have a lot of opportunities and a lot of places to go. And then um, here's another one. Uh, we do this at that. We have we have one of these uh, awareness lessons every unit we have um, six lessons in a unit the sixth lesson is about um, awareness of a job so here we have the gig economy another one is uh, food related jobs uh, here's one that is specifically about construction jobs and again we're talking about how much money they make how many jobs there are 
how what is the education that's necessary for that um, here's another one this one is um, on um, public safety so you can see how this goes and again there's lots of jobs here and then we zero in on one of them that's the idea here here's nursing this is one of my favorite graphs i really like this one um, so um, somebody asked what what level standout book is this from? Well, these are all from different levels. Um, this particular one that we're looking at right now is from book two, just so you know. Uh, but uh, it, we have different levels here. Um, so I'm going to turn the time over to Stacy. She's going to talk to you a little bit about uh, where we go from here. Okay, okay, so just to clarify, I know Rob said this, but just to clarify, um, this is now the new lesson six in all of the standout units. So before we had five lessons in a unit, and we've now added this lesson six as an integrated part of the unit that is going to focus on careers that are specific to that unit. So for example, this came out of the health unit. And um, you saw before that, um, well, Rob talked a little bit when you guys were going over the clusters um, about nursing that falls into the health category. So this is exact, this is how you would start the unit. You sort of start it with something broad and then you focus it. So look at this graph, work with a group. Not really, I know you're gonna work by yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the most common profession in 2008? Interesting question. I see. What does the size of the circle mean? Okay, so this is a little tricky. Um, so the title of this is Health Careers and Salaries in 2008. This is a unique graph because we don't often see circles, right? We see lines, we see bar graphs, um, we see pie charts. Um, but I think you can guess that the size of the circle is number of employees, right? Am I right about that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm looking at the, the physical therapist and the dental hygienist are a little smaller than the pharmacist. Okay, so if you look at the number of employees, which is the bottom, what which career was the most popular? Yep, registered nurse. Um, I see other some other answers. But if you see the registered nurse is all the way over at the 2,500,000 mark, Took me a second to calculate that to read that number okay so this is an example of students getting to see a bunch of different careers but then having to sort of work with the graph this is really good for them working with graphs and having to read them having to, to see the information so registered nurse great i just want to say one thing because uh, there, there was a question about um maybe we should have a legend the idea here is that we don't have a legend because we want them to figure it out that's part of the critical thinking if you look at the sizes of the the circles they get gradually smaller as you go to the left um and then you can figure you can figure it out it's not easy to figure out but we want the students to get challenged we want them to work through it all right stacy go ahead okay so then the next activity in that lesson would be looking at this uh, chart. And again, I know this is small, so if not everyone has a big computer screen, they might not be able to see this. And we're not actually really gonna do this activity, but I just want you to see that the next thing is them listening, listening to the different descriptions and looking at the education needed and the time that it would take to get that sort of certification. So the whole point of this is just to open the students' eyes to opportunities that might be out there for them. Maybe they never thought that, becoming a nurse is something they could do. Or um, maybe they never thought the licensed practical nurse, it only requires um, a diploma um, and it takes 12 to 18 months to get. And students maybe have thought, well, I could never be a nurse because that's just too much education, but I could do something that takes a little less time. Oh, and the certified nursing assistant, even less time, four to 12 weeks. I think Rob, when you, yeah, okay. So the activity here is that after they did this activity and they worked with the information in the chart, they would actually work in a group and discuss which kind of nurse they might choose to be. And it might be based on the time or, um, or money that it would cost to go to school to do certain things. Okay, great. So um, something that's really important in these lessons 
and Rob mentioned it briefly when he was talking about workplace awareness, is that we really want students to see what opportunities might be available to them. So it's not only important to introduce the opportunities, but it's also good to get them to reflect on who they are, what they can do, what they're good at. And ultimately this could help guide them in a different direction um, for a profession or a possible job that they might have in the future. So let's look at some different examples from Standout of reflection activities. So in the beginning of every book or in the beginning of every workplace lesson, um, workplace unit, we want students to start to think about the different character traits that they have. So in this example, you can see that we're introducing them to different character traits and Obviously, as a teacher, you would go through each of these and have students check off what they think is what they think they have. Um, and everyone's going to be different. So this is kind of a fun activity for students to do and kind of see who they are and what kind of traits they have. In the next activity, um, th and this is in the healthcare workers um, of unit or in the, in the health unit, but talking about healthcare workers, um, we are asking students to check what's true about them. So kind of look through those. And if students didn't check a lot of those boxes, maybe healthcare worker isn't, isn't for them. Maybe that's just not a profession that would be good for them. Okay, look at the next one. Food services. So now we're talking about food services and we're asking students to circle the traits that describe them. And then they're gonna think about character traits that are needed to do different jobs. So the exercise F says, if you're a food server, you might be good with people, outgoing, organized, compassionate, okay? And then we're asking students to think about other character traits for other jobs. All right, so let me talk just a little bit about digital literacy. One of the things that um, is so important, and I think that we've realized at this point is that digital liter or literacy Digital literacy and technology is very important. Here's a quote that I like from the BBC. It says, a degree of digital, it's a little hard for me to read with all my stuff up. Um, a degree of digital ex expertise has been expected even in roles unrelated to tech. So it's not that it's a technology job anymore. That's what it used to be. I want to work for Google and I need to know everything about technology. Not anymore. Just about every job from warehouse operators using cloud management systems to doctors um, having um, working with patients via remote, you know, uh, having um, a Zoom call to talk through a diagnosis, for example, managing construction. There's so many things that students need to be aware of so that they can function in the workplace. So, again, we make it possible for them to function in the classroom in the way they would function in the workplace. And that'll give them the experience they need to be productive and successful in the workplace. So here are a couple of examples. We have in Standout something called Life Online and sometimes they're just suggestions and other times they're activities. Um, here's one, um, sometimes interviews are online, read the list with a group, write a check next to the things you should do in an over in an online interview and write X next to what you should not do. So um, why don't you just tell us which ones, what should you do um, in a, which ones are things that you should do in an online interview? Any of those things are good or, yeah, go ahead and do that. Yeah, okay, good. Test it prepare, come a few minutes early. Yeah. All right. So you guys got the hang of it. Um, keep a messy desk. I, I'll tell you, uh, just from experience, we had interviews um, for um, positions at our school several times. And for a while, we were doing um, uh, uh, online um, interviews. And that was before COVID. And uh, there were people sitting on their bed with their legs crossed and wearing t-shirts. And that is not what we do. <laughs> if you want to get a good teaching job, for example, you should not do that. Presentations, everything. There's a lot of things that our students may not realize. I mean, these were professional people that were doing this. So I found it um, interesting. Um, so these kind of things are things that we want our students to be thinking about all the time. So there's that's an example. Here's another one. 
um, they're looking at uh, they're they're looking at this um, page here. Um, some neighborhood apps advertise similar types of information. So this again is accumulating information, but it's from online. So um, this kind of literacy, um, web in literacy, so they understand the internet and, and these things that they're studying is also very important. So let's just answer the question. What is the post about? What would students say? What is the post about? I just saw somebody read, wrote that you have a t-shirt on. It's okay. We can't see you. You're all right. It's not an interview either. <laughs> and you're not interviewing. <laughs> yeah. So you're okay. All right. So we're talking about, um, uh, it, it's about adoption. Okay. Uh, pet adoption. Um, and about all, uh, Los Alamitos animal care services. Stace. Yes. Uh, that just made me think some of us live close to these places. All right. What um, what time is the event? And the reason I'm asking you to do this, I know you can see it pretty quickly, but the reason I'm asking you to tell me what time is the event is because I want you to think about what the students are doing. There's a lot of words on this page. They need to be able to filter out the other words and find it. OK, where is the event at? So you are all looking, there's no address, but oh, there is. Is there an address? Yes, right in front. You see that? I always had it covered by my, my chat box. All right, hey, wonderful. So, so uh, yes, yeah, Bell Fowler Boulevard. And uh, that's great. So you get the idea that the students are actually developing skills to be able to read these things, but at the same time, they're learning English. So we put in integrating all of this together, all right? So we have that. Here's um, some suggestions here. Uh, it's, it, this is one um, that students just need to know. There's not really an activity here, but sometimes we just need to make sure students know of things to do. Um, what do you do? Uh, actually, there is something to do here. You're asking what you should do in an email versus what you should do in person. Like, do you ask for a raise in an email? Um, for example, so you can think about that and students get an opportunity to really think about that. Uh, using technology for personal communication is often prohibited. This is the one that I thought the other one was. So yes, um, here is just some information. When do you use technology? When is it appropriate in the classroom? So those are just some ideas. Go ahead, Stacy. Um, okay, it looks like our time is close to up. We're going to wrap this up really quick. I'm going to go over the agenda and then I think we might have a few minutes for questions, but I'll let Joy jump in and, and cut us off when we no longer can do that. Um, so anyway, today, just a quick recap. We went over workforce preparation. Rob talked about the standards and what the current employability skills are and what employers are looking for. Um, we talked about what the different soft skills in the workplace that employers are looking for and how we can translate that to the classroom when we're teaching our students. We talked about workplace awareness, um, giving students the opportunity to see what, what opportunities are out there for them, what sort of jobs they could get, what sort of professions they could eventually work towards. Um, and then Rob um, finished off talking about digital literacy, how important that is and how we can do digital literacy activities in the classroom with our students. So I think, do we have a few minutes? We can open it up to some questions and you can just type them in the chat box and we will try to answer them as many as we can, as fast as we can and, um, and go from there. Yeah, you guys can put them in the Q&A. You want them in the Q&A or the chat box or both? Q&A. So far we have one from Luva saying you added a new level you will have a will you have a special webinar about the literacy book yes luba we will it is next month in may stay tuned for that we can't wait to see you there we are and very very excited about that yeah we are very excited we'll put the information as an answer to your question um, uh, someone's asking when the new edition is going to be available joy you probably know that better than i do yeah some of the books will start being available next month and they are publishing through december of this year um and how long does it take to go over the whole book julia is asking do you guys want to talk about your pacing a little bit uh, sure so the book has uh the idea is that there's eight units eight units um if you if you use if you do two weeks per unit 
you can be done in 16 weeks. And that's kind of the idea, but it really depends on your program. Every program's different. If you're only uh, teaching six hours a week, you're not gonna make it. You should go through half of the book. Um, really, you need to have a, a full a full adult education programs often have four days a week type of um, instruction. Uh, but um, the idea here is to be done in one semester with each level of the book or one term. Each lesson is designed to be one, uh, one day. So if you think about it, there are six lessons uh, per uh, uh, unit. Um, so there's six and six, that's 12, that's 12 days. So yes, again, the I units know. do have to be done in sequence. Someone's asking that question because um, it progresses. As they learn grammar, you build upon it, you recycle, and the skills get more difficult as you go throughout the book. So yes, it, it does need to be done in order. Yeah, we think that that's a really important point. Um, it used to be 25 years ago, everybody was talking about open entry, open exit, which we still have and which we still do. But um, they would say, hey, yeah, you can you, you can come into our book um, three fourths of the way through the book and, and it won't be any harder than the beginning. Well, then our students aren't improving. <laughs> the idea is we want our students to improve. We want them to get better. And so this is an opportunity for them to do it. And this is kind of how what we're trying to accomplish here. Yeah, Munira, I see your question there. You teach the four different skills. Um, unfortunately, this book covers all those skills, or fortunately, I guess. Um, I don't know that it would fit under one of those book, one of those specifically. We do grammar, we do reading, we do writing, we do listening, we do speaking, we do all of it in one book. Um, there so are some programs that you stand out for uh, listening and speaking, but um, yeah, it's designed to have all, all four of the major skills. I'm trying to get back to Timothy's question. Um, his question is, I have many professionals from other countries, doctors, lawyers, bookkeepers, et cetera, and they need English to become certified in the USA. How can we best address these needs? Rob? Um, <laughs> uh, well, we don't, obviously we don't do certification. What we want our, our students to do is right. to learn the English and um, stand out is, is, we don't do as much academic as a more college type a college program would be. This is adult education, but um, I think that you'll find our approach will help the students learn faster than just about any other approach. The yep. integrated skills, the opportunity for them to uh, work in teams and in groups. Um, they are working with a lot of critical thinking. As you could see from some of our examples, there's critical thinking everywhere, which those synapses are, are, are um, firing up and students are learning faster. So we think that this is probably the fastest way for students to learn. It's not as detailed. For example, you're not going to go so deep into grammar that they, you know, it's not designed for that. It's not it's designed so that they can communicate in um, the workplace and in social situations and at home. Yep. Um, one question I see from Rita, which level of English is needed to study with this book? So as you can see on the screen, we have six levels, seven levels, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We have a brand new <laughs> literacy level, the one all the way at the left. So they don't need any English to start with this series. They can start at literacy, but if they already know how to read and write, they would go and start with the basic book, which comes right after literacy. When we talk about read and write, we mean read and write in their own language. So in English, if, if, if of course, we don't expect them to be able to read and yeah. write, but in, yeah. in, um, if in, they're their, literate own, in their own language. Yeah. Yes. If, if they don't have any literacy skills in their own language, they can still use stand out by starting at the literacy level. Wendy, thank you for your comment. Yes, we are so, so excited about this literacy book. We're going to be doing a presentation on that. So I hope to see you guys there. But this is something groundbreaking in the ESL uh, textbook world. Um, this is going to be geared towards adults, not a literacy book for children. This is a literacy book for adults. So we're super duper excited. About uh, let me answer a question that's in I the have, question. I've okay. put the webinar link in the chat for the literacy yep, webinar. I see there's it. a Great. lot of Thanks, questions Joy. about that. Okay. Thank you, guys. Let me just mention one thing that um, Kathy Brook Wong and Diane have asked about in the question and answer. They're asking about canvas shells or um, some sort of uh, mode of delivery. Um, we have what's now called Spark, which is brand new. This is a program that is a, um, a learning management system. Rob, go to the last slide. Okay, yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you. So this is a, a, a language management system. Is it here in the last slide? 
No, but I think if you go to- I'll pop it in the chat. Okay, okay perfect. Yeah. Thanks, Roy. All right. So Spark, what Spark is, is allows all of the resources, including the book itself and electronically, including all the audio and all the video, also the classroom presentation tool that has all the audio and video. Um, it has a management system for doing grades and for um, managing all your students' needs and being able to follow your students. And um, it has what's called online practice. The online practice is um, available on your their phones, their um, tablets and everything. So they'll be able to use that online practice to continue to practice like you would in a workbook, but it's online work. And so um, all of that will be monitored through the management system. And it's called Spark, again, Spark, S-P-A-R-K. Um, so this is, we're very excited about this opportunity as well. And Rob, I'm just gonna jump in and let people know if you do use Canvas or Blackboard or any very common LMSs, um, the Spark platform does have LTI integration. And so it will be able to fit right into your, your system that you use. Yes, that's great. Thank you, Joy, that's important. Okay, other questions? Thank you for all the thank yous, everyone. I've been reading them, thank you. I just read one, but I missed it. I gotta get back to it. It looked. Oh, the one from. It says where? Okay. Oh, what I want to say really quickly is I know some of you had questions and we weren't able to get to them and some of them looked pretty specific. I think I just saw something about present perfect. Look at the email addresses on the screen, write them down, screenshot it, send Rob and I an email. We would be more than happy to answer your questions offline. Anything specific about a specific book, a specific level, or just about ideas for activities that you can do in the classroom with your students. We love to talk to teachers. That's one of our joys. Um, after working with students, that's our second love is working with teachers. So please send us an email and we'd be happy to engage in a conversation with you about anything you have questions about. Um, I want to answer Pamela Jo Wilson's question. Um, very good question. I thought about this question many times. She asks, when we go in sequence, we often don't get to the unit that is most present on the state mandated assessment, employment. How do you recommend we prepare our learners for the unit before they are pulled out for testing? Okay, for number one, we are doing a lot of employment in the lesson sixes. So employment's there already um, in those terms. So every lesson six now has employment. So they're getting some introduction. Uh, the employment unit itself is at the end of the book. That's absolutely right. Um, when Stacy says that you can't go out of order, you can go out of order a little bit. Um, I, it's just, we don't, we don't recommend that you start in lesson five and then go to lesson one and then go to lesson three. We don't recommend that because of the progression of the book. But if you were to go into just before the state assessments, uh, if you're using CASAS, for example, or whatever, if you were to go into five, I mean, into uh, that's unit seven. So if you were to go into unit seven uh, instead of unit six and do that one first, I don't see any problem at all with doing that. It might be a little leap in the, a tiny bit of grammar or something. You could explore that and see, but I don't think that that would be a, a major headache. But again, don't forget everything we talked about in this workshop, the soft skills are not on the assessment very much. They are a little bit, but those um, those workplace preparation in every lesson, I mean, in every unit, lesson six in every unit will help them considerably to get ready for the assessment. I hope that helped. Thank you both so much. And thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate your time and attention. And we will be following up with all of you. Again, I will put the link for this new edition one more time in the chat. And we will see you all very soon, we hope, at our next webinar. Thank you again. Thank Thanks you, everybody. Thank you, guys. Hope to bye see bye. you next time. Bye.